If you are using the event app, we encourage you to check into the session, update your activities, and be sure to complete the session survey at the end. This session is TLP White and is being recorded. Recordings will be available within 24 hours via the app. And with that, I would like to introduce you to your session moderator, Olivier Califf. Thank you, and please take it away, Olivier. Hello to all of you, virtual attendees. So I'm Olivier Califf. I'll be moderating this session today. Uh, I'm a first liaison, and I now work for Sanofi, uh, a global uh, health and pharmaceutical company. And I was part of the 2020 program conference co committee. Um, question and answer will be at the end of the talk, so feel free to submit your, your questions using the Q&A um, feature, which is at the bottom of your Zoom browser. And with that, let's go ahead and get started. So I'm happy to introduce this presentation by Yukai Tan, who is a senior incident responder at Gojek. Uh, prior to that, he has been spending one year at VMware and five years at the Singapore uh, government agency performing computer forensics and uh, incident uh, response. And he's also uh, been releasing uh, a few open source tools, as you can see in his online bio. So with that, Mr. Tan, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Olivier, for the introduction. So I'll start by sharing my screen. So hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining me in this session. As EDR made host forensic artifact analysis obsolete, and how to combine them effectively for investigations. So my name is Yukai. I'm currently a senior incident responder at Gojek. So for those that are not familiar with this company, you can think of it as the Southeast Asia equivalent of Uber. So as introduced by Olivier, uh, I've spent six years in DFIR with five years in a public sector and a government agency in Singapore. That was followed by one year at VMware and then currently at Gojek. I'm also the author of the following forensic tools that you may or may not be familiar with. My contact information is on the right hand side of the slide, so you can contact me either via LinkedIn, Twitter, or GitHub. So the agenda for this session today is as follows. What I'm referring to by host forensic artifacts and what are its issues. This is followed by a short introduction of EDRs or endpoint detection and response and its issues. Then I'll summarize the issues that are raised for both of them and discuss why we need to combine them. Next, I'll be going through a few scenarios that shows how to combine both of them for investigations. And lastly, I'll be introducing two tools. The first, to collect host forensic artifacts at scale. And the second, to track changes in Windows event logs over different Windows versions. So what are host forensic artifacts? You can think of it simply as forensic artifacts that you find on hosts or endpoints. For example, for evidence or execution for Windows, you have mCache and AppCompact Cache, also known as Shim Cache. And for Mac OS, you have Knowledge C database. There are also many other types of artifacts like Windows registry hives, your various plists in Mac OS, Windows event logs, Apple unified logs, and many others. So one of the issues with the analysis of these artifacts or the main problem statement of this presentation is that the availability, the value to investigations and the structure of host forensic artifacts can differ over the different versions of the operating system. So the first example um, that I'm going to use is mCache for Windows. So mCache, as you know, consists of various files and the availability of these files can differ drastically over the different Windows versions, as you can see in this table. However, this table is just scratching a surface because its value to investigation as well as its structure also changes. So for more details, you can refer to a reference in this slide. Another example on Windows is at Combat Cache. This table shows that its value and structure also changes across the different Windows versions. Of note is that uh, the execution flag was removed in Windows 10, so we are no, no longer able to determine whether an application that was referenced by the app compact cache entry has executed on the system. So the last example is for Mac OS unified logs. So it has replaced system.log and Apple system logs and was introduced in Mac OS 10 control Sara. So the number of fields available for use within log entries since its introduction has increased from 16 in Sarah 
222 and high Sierra 227 MOF. Fortunately, this increase has remained constant or has stopped because in Catalina is still at 27. And typically, when we are analyzing unified, unified logs, we are focusing on four fields, timestamp, process, category, and the message field. And they are all available in the different versions of the unified logs. So why do these artifacts change? The obvious reason is that they are not created for forensic investigations. They are typically a byproduct of OS features. Take, for example, Ad Compact Cache is associated with the Microsoft application compatibility infrastructure. And its purpose is to enable the compatibility of existing software between the different versions of the Windows OS. It does this by tracking the metadata of the binary that was executed with Create Process API. And this metadata is the forensic artifact that we rely on during our investigations. Another reason for the change is because uh, the artifact has changed as the features that they depend on or they are based on has changed. Example would be Apple system logs transitioning to unified logs because Apple wanted a single logging mechanism for user and kernel mode where they had uh, ASL and BSM audit logs for each respectively previously. They also wanted a common logging system across the different Apple OS, like your iOS, tvOS, iPadOS, etc. They also wanted to integrate compression and privacy features into the logging system itself. So constantly changing artifacts can be associated with major feature updates of operating systems for Windows that comes twice a year and for Mac OS that comes once a year. As a result, analysts have to continuously play catch up. They have to constantly research and keep up with the artifacts changes. They also have to validate and compare the past output of different tools to ensure that these tools support the latest version of the artifacts to ensure accuracy in the investigations. All this takes valuable time away from their core job of performing investigations. So with the limitation of host forensic artifacts, the question is, can we rely solely on EDRs to perform investigations instead? So we, before we go into that, a short introduction of EDRs is that it's previously Endpoint Threat Detection and Response, ETDR, with the extra T. It was a term coined by Dr. Enter Chukakin in 2013, where Endpoint was as opposed to just network, threat as opposed to just malware, and it was primarily used for detection and response. It was subsequently renamed to Endpoint Detection and Response in 2015, and its focus remains the same, primarily on investigations and less focus on full disk image acquisition and analysis that you typically associate with traditional computer forensics. There are many EDR solutions in the market, and each brings to the table unique features. For example, the querying of endpoints using OS query that you see in Carbon Black, Next Gen AV using machine learning, asset discovery features, vulnerability detection management features. Because we do not want to go into every single feature of every EDR solution out there, the scope of this presentation is restricted to features that are common in most EDR solutions, and there will be event telemetry and remote response. So for event telemetry, it refers to the feature that records all events happening on the endpoint, such as the process executions, registry modifications, and network connections. These collected events are typically analyzed in real time and all in the cloud for detection and prevention. They are also stored in a searchable data store for the analyst to review and to track hard. You can think of event telemetry as unfiltered data in carbon black, Endpoint activity monitoring in CropStrike or deep visibility or Sentinel One. So, all these three are EDR solutions. For remote response, uh, it's a feature that enables the investigation and remediation of threats in real time remotely. So, the benefits include enhanced visibility to systems across the enterprise and it also reduces the time required to respond to threats as analysts no longer require physical access to infected systems to remediate threats. The capabilities can be divided into three parts. Firstly, the collection of information that includes the exploring of file system, extracting files, and listing running processes. The second, the execution of scripts, such as PowerShell or shell scripts, that enable the execution of multiple commands. The last is uh, remediation of threats. 
which includes uh, deleting a malicious file or killing a malicious process or deleting a malicious registry key. So we can think of remote response as equivalent to live response feature in Chrome Black, real-time response on RTR and CrowdStrike, or full remote shell in Sentinel-1. Unfortunately, EDOS also has its limitations and uh, this, the first is the limited retention of event telemetry due to a high volume of events being collected. So each endpoint can generate hundreds of megabytes per day, and this becomes especially significant for companies with many employees. They forward it to a SIM, then uh, the decision has to be on whether to drop less important event types that sacrifices contextual information during investigations, or higher retention of more important event types, like for example, process execution. With limited retention, analysts will not be able to query or hunt for relevant events to investigations that happen too far back. Another limited limitation of EDRs is coverage. This can be divided into two parts, event coverage and device coverage. Firstly, for event coverage, different EDR solutions will prioritize different event types to record. So while most of them can agree that you know, process executions, registry modifications, network connections are important event types that should be recorded, there are also other event types that are only recorded in specific EDR solutions. For example, network traffic size, browser history, or suspicious API calls event types. So depending on the EDR solution that is being adopted, the analysts have to uh, make use of host forensic artifacts to fill in the missing gaps for a more comprehensive investigation. So the other part of coverage is device coverage. So it might not be possible to achieve 100% device coverage uh, for EDRs over or through the enterprise due to many reasons. For example, license limitation where the company growth exceeds the number of licenses available platform support limitations where the EDR cannot be installed on rare versions of Linux or older versions of the operating system, company policies on deploying on mission critical servers where there's a fear that uh, these agents will compete for resources uh, with critical services or processes, and also it might not be installed on unmanaged devices or bring our own devices. So uh, if an incident were to occur on an endpoint with our EDR agent installed, retrospective events will not be available, and the analyst will have to depend on host sponsored artifacts for analysis. The last limitation that I'm going to touch on is the possible bypassing of EDRs that impacts its availability. So Sophos actually identified two such, two such techniques used in late 2019 and early 2020. So the first article, Living Off Another Land, Ransomware Borrows Vulnerable Driver to Remove Security Software. So what happened was that Sophos observed the adversary deploying a signed uh, legitimate gigabyte driver that drops a second unsigned driver. So this second driver kills the process and deletes files that belongs to the endpoint protection software via kernel mode. And this enables the bypassing of the temporal protection of the software that enables the ransomware to execute without interference. The second article is Snatch Ransomware Reboots PCs into Safe Mode to Bypass Protection. So, so first observe the ransomware installing itself as a Windows service, adding a registry key to the registry to ensure that it boots during safe mode, then reboots the PC into safe mode. So this technique allows it to bypass endpoint protection software that does not run in safe mode. So with the mentioned limitations of both host forensic artifacts and EDRs, it kind of makes sense to combine both of them as one tends to make up for the limitations of the other. For example, if an analyst is not up to date with the latest versions of evidence or execution forensic artifacts, they can instead rely on the EDR telemetry or event telemetry for process execution to complete their investigation. Another reason to combine them is the accelerated network paradigm shift due to the COVID-19 situation. As a result of COVID-19, more employees are actually working remotely. There are less employees within the network security parameter, hence also less amount of employee traffic going through network security appliances. 
there are also more applications, files, and data moving towards the cloud, and more employees are accessing the cloud for work and productivity. So as a result, uh, you can say that now security appliances are bypassed, and from an analyst perspective, uh, network artifacts or network traffic logs are, are not available. And so we have to actually rely more on what is available at the endpoint, which is your EDR telemetry and your host forensic artifacts. So it makes sense to combine them both to maximize what we have. Next, I'll be going through a few scenarios that shows how to combine both EDRs and host forensic artifacts for, uh, to facilitate investigations. So the first scenario pertains to identifying the source of initial PA load of a drive-by download malware infection. This might not be trivial to determine using an EDR because it might not record the event telemetry that you associate with the full URL that was accessed by the browser at the endpoint. This could be further complicated if the user use encrypted DNS. So a quick solution to this, assuming that the file is still on this, is to use the EDR's remote response capability to query host forensic artifacts for Mac OS, there will be the Spotlight Metadata Attribute PMD Item Platforms. And for Windows, the Zone Identifier ADS or Alternate Data Stream. And for both of them, you can see that it actually managed to find the source of the download, the first line here, as well as the second line here. So the second scenario pertains to identifying or surfacing suspicious user logons and types. Again, uh, this might not be trivial to determine with EDRs as many of them do not record authentication telemetry. So a solution to this is again to use the EDRs remote response capability to pull or collect host forensic artifacts. In this case for Windows, Windows event logs, for Mac OS, the Apple Unified logs. And after collecting these logs, the analyst can perform filtering or perform queries to obtain the desired information. The last scenario pertains to determining whether exfiltration has been performed by the adversary. So uh, this is again not trivial to determine with endpoint solutions as many of them, while they record network connections, they do not record the incoming network traffic size and outgoing network traffic size. So this may even more difficult if you do not have network artifacts available or network logs available. So one solution to this is again to use the EDR's remote response capability to collect host forms and artifacts. In this case for Windows, the system resource usage monitor from ESE database or for Mac OS, the net usage SQLite database. So after collecting these two databases, you can perform queries to obtain the desired information. In this case, there'll be the bytes in and bytes out for each individual process. So having established how uh, host for forensic artifacts can complement EDRs to perform investigations, I'd like to introduce a tool that I've written called BoxStrike. So it leverages a remote response capability or EDRs to make host forensic artifacts more accessible. It's written for CrowdStrike, hence its name, but similar tools exist for other EDRs. So it's able to simultaneously connect to multiple remote systems to issue multiple commands. Other features of BoxStrike includes the uploading of files and scripts to CrowdStrike Cloud. And this, this scripts and files can then be pushed to the endpoint for execution. Another feature is that it's able to queue offline commands on offline hosts so that these commands can be executed when these hosts come online. So BoxStrike is available on my GitHub repository or the link at the left hand bottom hand corner of the slide. So uh, this slide shows a demo of BoxStrike. So basically it shows how it makes use of KIP, which is Crow Artifact Parser Extractor, where it will push it down to the remote endpoint uh, to collect host forms and artifacts. So in this demo, it will connect to multiple endpoints. And one quick tip for using KIP is that you can remove the GUI executable as well as the modules folder that will reduce the total file size of Kip to less than 10% of its original size, making it more bandwidth efficient to push it down to the endpoint. 
So because of time constraints, I'll not be playing this demo in full. So if you are interested, you can access it at the GitHub repository. So after successful execution, this whole sponsor artifacts will be uploaded across Stripe Cloud, where you can actually download it to your system via the CrossStrike web console. So before moving on to the next tool, um, we need to understand how an event of an event log is shown in a Windows event viewer. So when a user selects an event in the Windows event viewer, the event is read from uh, the event viewer reads the provider event ID and event data from the event itself. However, this event data contains missing information such as the event description, as well as the field names. So they have to fill in this missing information. And one way to do this is to query this registry key at the channel and provider, which are values that it reads from the event as well as the event log file. Next, it will read the value event message file to obtain the location of the DLL that contains the event message. This event message will contain the missing information, which it will then interpolate back into the event to show the complete event to the user. So what the second tool, which is NSA Cyber's Windows Event Log Messages tool does is that for all the DLL files, it will extract all the event messages of all possible Windows events that could be generated by the operating system. So this is a sample of an event message that's extracted by WLM2. So this is for a very common event, which is Windows Security Event ID 4624, which is the successful on event. So this message contains the missing information, the event description, as well as the field names that are mapped to the position that it appears within the event data of the event. So as mentioned previously, WRM is able to extract this message for all possible Windows events that could be generated on the host OS. And its output looks something like this. This is the text output, it also has the CSV output and the JSON output. So it's able to actually export 47,317 event messages for the OS where each line represents an event. Five minutes remaining. Okay. With the release of this tool, NSA Cyber has released um, the assets for fresh OS installations up to Windows 10 version 1703 and Windows Server 2016 version 1607. Unfortunately, no new data sets have been released since then. So what I've done is to fork the repository and created a new release with data sets for the latest three releases of Windows 10. I've also compiled the binary or the code of NSA Cybers and release it in this uh, release as well. So uh, any user is able to download the zip file to a fresh OS installation, unzip it and run the batch file with admin privileges to generate the Windows event messages for that OS is executing from. So primary usage for uh, Windows uh, WLM2 is that it's able to uh, determine what are the changes in Windows event logs over the different OS fields. So what, what I have here is the comparison between the two latest releases of Windows 10 between 2004 and 20H2, where 20H2 was released just last month. So on the right hand side, you have 20H2 and you can see that there are several new events in 20H2. Unfortunately, it contains uh, missing information such as where it's being logged to for these new events. As far as uh, um, the event message that tells you what is it being used for. This is commonly not very useful for investigations. However, if we were to do a comparison between the Windows event messages for 2004 and 1909, which was released in last November, there are actually two events that could be useful for investigations. The first new event is event ID 207 from Microsoft Windows Storage Spaces Driver. So this event is generated each time a storage device or is, whether it's removable or internal is plugged into the system. So this is an event that could be useful for USB investigations. The other new event is event ID 151 from Microsoft Windows NTFS operational. So this event is generated every one hour 
but it will actually show the number of files that were deleted in the past one hour. It also identify the responsible process. So how you interpret this event is that in the last one hour, it found that 9,491 files were deleted and it was able to identify the responsible process for all the deletions. And it will generate a separate event ID 151 for every responsible process. So this particular process or event is for PyCharm 64.exe, where this process is responsible for three out of the 9,000 plus file deletions. So this event could be useful to help you determine what are the active processes in one hour periods. It could also be used to identify uh, disruptive malware as well as rogue users deleting a large volume of files in file servers. With this, I've come to the end of the, my presentation. So very much, thank you very much for your time. So please feel thank free to leave your questions in the Q&A. Yeah, thank you very much. So we have uh, one question in the pipe, uh, which uh, says from Just Bowling, sorry if I miss it, but what scripts are you using to gather host artifacts and is it available to others? Uh, so uh, mainly I'm using Cape, which is Crow Artifact Parser and Extractor. So I think this is a very popular tool by Eric Zimmerman, where you can actually do a quick Google search. And I think that will be one of the first results that are available. So what this tool does is that allow you to collect. So you can actually set up the command line using Cape, and then you can actually choose the artifacts that you want to collect. And then you copy the command line, and then you actually run it via the remote response capability of the EDR. Thank you. Uh, another question related, related to the uh, retention. You've been talking about retention earlier in the presentation. Uh, is it a problem with you uh, or in some countries uh, due to uh, local regulations or privacy issues? Yeah, I think that, like what you said, there could be actually different uh, regulations for different countries, especially uh, privacy laws in Europe, for example. And there could also be different laws that actually requires their logs to be retained for a certain period for compliance purposes. So it really depends on uh, what you're trying to adhere to and which region you are residing in. There's also another fact that you know, employees actually agree to be monitored um, when they sign the employment contract. So, I mean, they are actually giving out their privacy in that sense because they are actually using the work laptop and they have agreed uh, to be monitored. So there shouldn't be an issue there, but then I'm not an expert on this, so that's just my opinion. Okay, thank you. And one final question in uh, two minutes, please. Uh, can this tool be integrated with domain controllers uh, to sweep across various endpoints? Unfortunately, uh, there's no such feature yet. So uh, what can you do with, with this tool is that you can actually go to a CrossFit web console and then try to download all the hosts that is actually reporting back to CrowdStrike. And then with the host ID, you can actually um, list them down in a text file and then in, use it as an input to the box strike tool. And then you can use it to communicate with all the endpoints in this way. Okay, so no other questions. So uh, first I'd like to thank you for uh, this uh, great presentation and answer to the questions. Uh, thank you to all of you virtual attendees, especially to those who've been asking uh, questions. I hope you enjoyed this presentation as much as I did. And this session is now over, so please log off from, from this session and log in to the next schedule one for, for you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Olivia. And thanks, Olivia, for moderating. Welcome.